Welcome everybody. Glad to have you all with us. Um, we are very much looking forward to this collaboration with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, I'll just put in a little plug for NHC that this is our 90th anniversary year. We were founded in 1931. I always like to say Eleanor Roosevelt held our first fundraiser. And um, we've had um, uh, quite the exciting uh, nearly a century. Uh, certainly um, the last 18 months, uh, almost two years now, has been um, a uh, um, unprecedented uh, and historic time uh, for the country, for the world, uh, and certainly for NHC. And uh, it hasn't all been about the pandemic. Um, climate is um, an issue that has just gotten more and more um, obvious um, to all of us. And um, the climate imperative continues to um, uh, be um, a rising uh, issue uh, politically. Um, you can check us out at nhc.org, um, and if you're not a member, um, you can click on the join box in the upper right corner of the homepage and uh, join great organizations like RMI um, who have become members of uh, NHC in the last year. The importance of the intersection of housing policy and the climate crisis is becoming increasingly clear as governments and private industry Think of policy tools to address uh, what is a very complicated issue. 2020 um, was the most active hurricane season on record um, and threatened the homes of hundreds of thousands of families, uh, ultimately leading to billions of dollars of natural disaster damages. We'll see what happens with 2021, but as all of us who watch the news at all understand, um, it's already uh, Quite, quite a year. Um, the urgency for creative government action and market-based solutions is really uh, greater than ever. In, in recent weeks, HUD has issued dozens of notices of disaster relief efforts to states across the country, recovering from hurricanes and wildfires, tropical storms and floods. Um, uh, FHFA uh, ha has issued a request for input on climate and natural disaster, disaster risk, and uh, recently met with NHC to discuss the impacts of climate change on housing. I think it's been um, really refreshing to see uh, FHFA leaning into a wide range of issues um, uh, because frankly, they are regulating uh, about a fifth of the economy. And um, uh, it really just underscores how important housing is and the impact of housing and the impact of climate on housing uh, in so many ways. We are thrilled to have the Rocky Mountain Institute as um, a new member of NHC. And we have been working closely with Greg Hopkins, who you're gonna hear from momentarily to put on this webinar. Greg is a manager for carbon-free buildings at RMI and was instrumental in uh, bringing this group of experts together to talk about uh, the green mortgage market. Um, we're looking forward to hearing uh, from the presenters on how we can leverage FHFA and the enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to create a stronger green mortgage market, more resilient homes, and uh, help to mitigate the devastating impacts of rapidly advancing climate change. So Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks very much, David. Let me just See if I can share my screen. That's showing up okay. Take that as a yes. Hi, everyone. That's the yes looks great. Okay, great. Um, thanks, David, for the intro. Thank you to, to the NHC team for having us. Um, thank you all for joining. My name is Greg Hopkins. As, as David mentioned, I'll be your moderator for the webinar. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm a manager at RMI, uh, an independent nonprofit organization of over 400 staff working to accelerate the clean energy transition and improve lives through market-based solutions. I am joined by a few of our partners today who I'll introduce in, in just a moment. Um, but first, just wanted to quickly frame up our discussion over the next hour. Um, if you haven't heard of green mortgages before, don't worry, you are not alone and we'll, we'll cover the basics. The important thing we want you to take away is that there is a big untapped market opportunity here 
to the tune of an estimated $2 trillion to scale up existing mortgage products offered by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to finance much needed home energy improvements and resilience improvements nationwide. As David was touching on, the climate crisis is upon us. We're already feeling the effects. The housing stock is already bearing the brunt. This trend will continue to get worse in the years ahead if we do not act with urgency to decarbonize and strengthen our housing, which accounts for one fifth of all national emissions. Um, we acknowledge that variations of these kinds of mortgage products have been attempted in the past with no real success at a national scale, but we're going to talk through here why things are fundamentally different today and why now is the moment for the GSEs, FHFA, and other market actors to, to really step up and start leading the industry down a path towards more affordable, more resilient, uh, more equitable, and lower carbon housing for American families. So just to jump into it, here's our agenda. Um, we are wrapping up opening remarks. We're going to hear about single family housing market challenges and opportunities related to this. We'll touch on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's role in the marketplace and the green mortgage products that they already offer. Um, then we'll turn to how we can support the development of the green mortgage market on the single family side. Uh, and we'll close out with some federal policy opportunities and calls to action for you all to consider. Um, after those presentation segments, we'll open it up to Q&A and discussion. So along the way, definitely encourage you all to engage with us, use the chat function, share ideas, suggestions, questions, uh, and we can pick those up at the end of the webinar or follow up on them afterwards if we, if we run out of time. So to introduce our panelists, and I'll ask these folks to turn their cameras on as, as we go. Um, first up, you're going to hear from Madeline Salzman. Madeline is a management and programs analyst in the US Department of Energy's Building Technologies Office. She joined the DOE in 2015 to manage programs that increase access to energy efficient technologies, including through the Home Energy Score program and the Better Buildings Workforce Accelerator. She currently leads clean energy workforce development strategy for the DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And Maddie also conducts strategic analysis on how to increase access to efficiency retrofits in US housing across income groups, uh, regions, and housing types. Next up will be Rita Ballesteros. Rita is a housing industry consultant working with organizations on strategies in affordable housing, finance, servicing, loss mitigation, and programs that improve home habitability, efficiency, and resiliency. She worked at Fannie Mae for 10 years where she led the affordable housing preservation activities for its uh, single family duty to serve requirements, as well as energy financing initiatives. And prior to that, Rita had significant consulting experience with KPMG. She will be followed by David Heslam, who has been a national leader in efforts to develop home energy labeling systems that allow the value of energy performance to be gauged by real estate stakeholders. David has a background as a green builder, and since he started at Earth Advantage in 2008, he's worked on programs in 16 different states and advocated for the use of national standards. His work at Earth Advantage has included software development, research into the effectiveness of energy audits and the feasibility of labeling programs, uh, implementation of programs to enable the valuation of green and energy efficient homes, as well as green education for designers, contractors, realtors, bankers, and appraisers. And then you'll hear from me on RMI's perspective on federal policy opportunities and calls to action. So with that, I will turn it over to Maddie to get us started. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Greg and David and uh, everyone who's helped make this event possible. I'm really excited to be speaking with all of you about why, uh, this really important topic. Um, you know, you will see this slide, but it will it will fill in as we go on throughout the presentations about the confluence of um, opportunities and challenges right now that we think are really um, pointing towards the need for unlocking um, green mortgage financing opportunities nationwide. Um, so, as Greg mentioned, my name is Madeline Salzman. I work for the U.S. Department of Energy. Most of my focus 
to start off this conversation is really going to be talking about the landscape of the single family housing market, what the current status is, what are many of the barriers and issues going on, um, and, and really just kind of set the tone for the solutions and technology areas that the others are gonna discuss. Uh, next slide. So first off, by the numbers, um, I wanted to highlight a few elements of America's single family housing market as it exists today. Um, so, uh, you know, housing represents approximately 95% of U.S. buildings. Um, I sometimes ask people to try to guess this number and nobody guesses quite that high. Um, it makes sense. They, they are the buildings that we all live in. Um, and there are millions and millions of housing units across the country, uh, 98 million in fact, that um, house people that where they spend a lot of time, especially during the pandemic. Um, and a lot of it is infrastructure that needs to be updated. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, residential buildings also consume about 21% of US energy and uh, about equivalent amount of emissions. That's actually recently in the last couple of years um, grew to be more than that of commercial buildings. Um, we're seeing more efficiency deployment happen at scale in commercial buildings, um, but residential buildings are currently lagging. Um, as David alluded to earlier, we also know that there's extreme weather damages um, every year, 95 billion in 2020. Um, but here's another big number, uh, over a trillion dollars worth of GSE backed mortgage volume that happens annually. This is already what's going on and I think a, a large amount of uh, capital to tap into. Next slide. So uh, I won't read through all of these items on this chart, but I think it's really important to acknowledge the full framework of the confluence of crises that are happening in housing right now. Um, you know, uh, we are not gonna propose a single solution that's a silver bullet across all of these areas. I think that's really important to acknowledge, but this has to be an understood component of how we are designing solutions. There is currently a housing affordability crisis. Um, there's lacking supply and increasing housing costs. There's incredible inequality in housing. I'm sure this is not an audience I need to, um, you know, compel on this issue, but there is a large gap between uh, black and white household home ownership. Um, and there's been decades of policies that have contributed to these issues. Um, also infrastructure is something that we hear a lot about um, in DC these days. And it's important because half of US households are over 40 years old. And uh, many Americans uh, live in housing that hasn't been updated in a really long time, which impacts their health and well-being. And of course, the context of climate change is driving up costs for repairs, um, issues related to uh, resilience. You know, we're seeing fires from floods, and these represent real issues that contributes to the other areas as well. Next slide. So given all of that kind of daunting array of crises, you could spend a lifetime working on just one of those, let alone all four. Um, we want to push forward the need for home energy improvements that drive resident benefits. This is not the only solution that will be needed in this space, to be clear, it's not a silver bullet, but it is a necessary component of where we need to go. Um, most single family housing needs upgrades that can improve their affordability and energy burdens. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Health and safety risks, carbon pollution, resilience to extreme weather and disasters, and can be implemented in a way that um, helps minimize racial and wealth inequities. Um, and, you know, at the very least does not exacerbate that context. Um, you know, we believe that there is a lot of potential for equitable delivery at scale of these uh, financing products um, to include transparent uh, uh, solutions that include transparency, market signals and incentives, and convenient low-cost finance solutions. Um, we think there's, you know, addressing all those things at once can be a challenge, but we think it'll be not only possible, but necessary to address these things in tandem. Next slide. So you might be wondering, you know, those are a lot of big issues. Why are we honing in just on home energy use? And I wanna just bring attention to some statistics around how energy use and housing is already impacting homeowners and renters and has been for decades. Um, you know, when we look at uh, households learning less than 70K a year, we see that energy costs represent a really significant proportion of their uh, uh, 
costs every month. Um, it's actually higher in this group than typical property taxes or insurance and maintenance costs on an annual basis. Um, and, you know, in our work, we call this an energy burden. And this presents a really um, challenging issue for uh, ensuring that, you know, these homeowners, rather than spending money on their energy bills, are able to save and put money towards other resources. And we know, you know, this has been a blind spot for mortgage prophecies, but we know this is already impacting people. Um, EIA data tells us that nearly one third of households report facing a challenge in paying their energy bills. One in five report reducing or foregoing food or necessities like medicine to pay an energy bill. And back in 2012, we found that it was the most common reported reason for individuals seeking payday loan products to pay their utility bills. So um, this is already an affordability and equity issue um, that has largely been ignored that we think um, could be better accounted for. Next slide. Um, what makes matters worse is that if we want to address some of the housing infrastructural issues, outdated equipment, um, broken windows, um, you know, drafty walls that uh, contribute to those higher energy costs, um, today, most of the people that are able to access improvements, by and large, are using cash from savings. That's that light blue bar there on here, and this is from um, the Joint Center uh, data. And, you know, what we'd love to see is that more homeowners don't need that large blue bar of cash from savings <laughs> in order to access the benefits of energy efficiency and improved housing. We think there's a lot of benefits that can be delivered not just to the consumers, but also to um, the lenders, particularly when you look at the full uh, mortgage portfolio. Um, so these present some of the general issues. We can go to the next slide, um, which just kind of sums up my portion of the presentation that we have mounting crises to address housing and affordability and equity, aging infrastructure and climate change. Um, uh, you know, I didn't touch on these as much, but we, we also have kind of this moment where we have low interest rates and a high need and demand for home improvements. We see that people want to improve their housing, but don't always know how to get there. So with that, I will turn it over to Rita to talk more about uh, the role of institutions. Great. Thank you, Maddie, for a thoughtful layout of the energy burden and climate impact challenges today's homeowners face, particularly those with low incomes and in communities of color. Another... Um, you want to hit the next slide there, Greg. Another really important driver in our case for change is the role and demand in the capital markets. You know, at the core of the GSE's business um, and what provides ongoing liquidity is their ability to pool mortgages together and create mortgage-backed securities, or MBS, for sale into the secondary market. Um, being able to generate enough volume of single-family mortgages that can be eligible for green MBS is a key factor in unlocking the whole green mortgage market and keeping capital flowing to finance green homes and improvements. Because demand from investors for ESG or environmental social governance investments um, like, those like these types of green bonds continues to outpace supply, you know, this often results in a modest premium or as the industry calls it, a greenium. Also, many of the world's largest financial institutions have committed to climate-aligned lending and investment activities with the goals of the Paris Agreement, but they're lacking sufficient market-ready green investments to fully make that shift. So we think the mortgage industry can be well-positioned to help fill that gap. Recently, both of the GSEs started single-family green MBS programs, kind of following the success they had in multifamily. Um, last spring, Fannie Mae launched its first security, um, but to date, all of the offerings have only included mortgages for Energy Star certified new construction homes. Um, while Freddie followed with their launch this year, um, they're financing upgrades to solar energy uh, as, to, as a start. Uh, we think um, that both these programs can go a lot further to include pathways for millions of existing single family homes to benefit from the capital market support of green improvements. Next slide. Yeah, so before we delve into the details of what these products are and how they work, let's consider what success could look like if we unlock the market. Um, so certainly you've seen, you know, many estimates and cute icons for various climate related interventions, but here we highlight our analysis of the significant benefits and impact of Fannie and Freddie's potential role 
if green mortgages scale to even just 15% of their annual single family volume over the next 10 years. And by the way, that's just half the level of their multifamily green lending. Streamlining and scaling up their existing green mortgage products to that level could generate more than $2 trillion of green MBS within a decade. Um, approximately 50 billion of project specific capital would be spent, which would improve nearly 9 million homes across the country, generate net cost savings of 12 billion for consumers, create roughly 650,000 domestic jobs, and avoid 57 million metric tons of carbon emissions. Um, at the end of this presentation, you'll see a link to uh, the report that was alluded to um, or discussed earlier, and that has a lot more detail on how we got to these estimates, in case you're wondering. So because of their size and the influence the GSEs can have, um, they can have a really big impact and can be big levers for market transformation. And so that's why we're so focused on them to accelerate the availability and adoption of scalable low cost financing solutions for homes that are in need of energy efficiency, resiliency, and other solutions to address health, climate change, and decarbonization. Next slide. So green mortgage is 101. So let's cover briefly um, what these existing green mortgage options are. So each Fannie and Freddie have, have a branded product that offers certain flexibilities when a homeowner rolls qualified improvements into their purchase or refinance mortgage for an existing home. So these items are taken into consideration when the appraisal is done and the homeowner's underwriting is actually based on the as completed value. Um, although then they, they actually have up to 180 days to have the work completed. So the value is, is um, in consideration of what they plan to do. And the amount that they can finance into the mortgage is up to 15% of that new value. Um, both Fannie and Freddie permit basic weatherization like insulation, energy and water efficiency improvements such as new HVAC or windows, um, as well as renewable energy systems like solar. Fannie also includes resiliency features that protect the home from natural disaster or the impacts from climate change. And they both allow in a refinance the inclusion of existing energy debt for prior work on the home. And that's a really important feature for a borrower who has taken out other types of consumer financing already. Um, as Maddie showed you, uh, it's not just cash, but, but they're also taking out uh, consumer um, loans, um, putting things on credit cards, and the GSEs allow that to be refinanced um, at a later time. Certain new projects are going to require a home energy report to support the qualified efficiencies, but others like weatherization and renewables do not. Um, and as I go through all these things, I just I do want to highlight that um, this is a very high level summary of what they're offering and certainly um, the GSEs policies and guides would, would apply to all of the details and the terms and conditions. But it is clear that these options can offer consumers many benefits. A mortgage gives access to what is likely the very lowest cost of capital from a trusted source, their lender, and comes with the consumer protections of the mortgage transaction. It's also available at a, at a, excuse me, at a convenient intervention, that is when buying the house and identifying the needs at that time or refinancing. And again, in, in the case of the latter, um, which is often what, what, what homeowners are utilizing these products for, um, you know, this type of loan is essentially is a cash out refi for the purpose of making improvements, but without the added interest rate cost of a typical cash out. So let's quickly touch upon um, the scale um, that we're seeing with this. So in spite of all this, there really hasn't been a lot of traction in single family, as we've mentioned. Um, Fannie and Freddie's new programs are good moves, but uh, in the right direction, but they're far behind the green multifamily market. Um, you know, Fannie started that program in 2012, and it's now grown to become the world's largest green bond issuer. And that's for green securities of any type, not just mortgages. Um, and this has represented about 30% of all of their multifamily mortgages go into the green MBS. There's a lot of success there and a good foundation, but we really should soon want to expect them to be dwarfed by the single family side, which has the potential to get into billions of green issuance. So not going into kind of the differences between these two business sides. Um, but when you look at the proportionate securitizations in the early days, the single family side has a lot of opportunity to catch up to this trajectory. Um, I know by the way, you know, in case you missed it earlier, Fannie's green MBS to date 
um, is only for new construction. And so we see there is actually a disconnect between their current issuances um, efforts on the green MBS side and their specific product that actually finances the much needed energy and resiliency improvements for the aging housing stock. Um, let's go really quickly into what are some of the challenges and why aren't we seeing this traction? Um, you know, in our view, before single family green mortgages and then the issuance of green MBS can reach their potential, a number of these challenges have got to be addressed. So adoption of existing products remains extremely low to date due to a combination of factors, um, including lack of awareness and training, operational pain points that add complexity, time and costs, and a lack of comparables for evaluation. So the volumes aren't really known outside of the public uh, disclosures that are given in the new green um, securities issuances, which again for Fannie is not related to its home style energy mortgage. Uh, we know from industry conversations and the reporting and projections from duty to serve plans that these are very low. Um, those duty to serve plans do involve activities for financing improvements, but the purchases numbers that they're disclosing and their, their projections are only in the hundreds of loans today. So how can we fix this? Um, well, the administration and FHFA can intervene, but a lot can be undertaken by leveraging tools and leadership in place at the GSEs. Increasing awareness and enhancing skills can be overcome with increased marketing, education, and training. But what's really keenly needed is a combination of data and process updates to make it easier for lenders to offer and close these loans. And a big blind spot is that the data is not showing up. So there's now sophisticated, credible, and readily available home energy data systems and tools that can integrate into existing, uh, into, I'm sorry, into increasingly automated mortgage underwriting and appraisal processes. Lists of eligible energy efficiency products that meet rigorous standards can also help simplify the process for lenders. And efforts underway to update appraisal data could be expanded to help with the valuation requirements. In a minute, David will expand on these technology and tools and efforts, and our report also provides details. So beyond the integration of tools and data needed, we also want to highlight that the GSE's green mortgage products and their related efforts under duty to serve should go further and be more ambitious. Given the opportunity to address health and climate benefits, upgrades to switch out fossil fuel systems and appliances to electric should be eligible. And there's a big opportunity to increase green financing in underserved communities. The next slide. So finally, before I turn it over, I'll add these data and technology tools to the growing list of why now. Um, David's going to expand on how the UAD redesign effort, DOE's home energy score, and a tool from the national labs, as well as more commonly used standards are more are important to unlocking this market. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rita, um, for setting that up. And thank you to the housing conference for having me here today. Um, look forward to the conversation at the end. Um, as well. So uh, yeah, the why now is the central question across this whole uh, discussion today. And you know, right now, I think everybody knows has been, been mentioned, the concept of financing energy improvements through mortgage um, origination has been around for decades. Um, and there's only been marginal success, as Greg mentioned. And um, that success has typically come when an individual lender or even an individual loan officer has really taken it upon themselves to promote these type of loans, um, which in a variety of forms have existed uh, for over 30 years. Um, and from this technical perspective, you know, why is it now the time for it to go mainstream? Well, I think it's because these systems that are in place now, they make it easy. Um, and in the near future, it's gonna be even easier um, because automated systems are gonna take more and more of the process burdens away from the individual people involved. Um, as a for instance around that, if you look at what's happened in the last 18 months um, with appraisals around the United States um, due to the pandemic and folks not being able to get into houses, um, the number of appraisals that didn't involve an appraiser going into a home, um, it's now more than half of mortgage originations. Um, and that was a result of that need but similarly, the same sort of tools that have gone into effect for that are gonna enable a lot more uh, easier processing of this type of loan. So 
So next slide, please, Craig. Thanks. And in terms of talking about <clears throat> making things easy, um, I mean, that to me is one of the central questions, as I just mentioned. Um, and my favorite saving saying on all this is, you know, it's pretty easy for the McDonald's salesperson um, to sell you some fries when you stop by for something else um, because they know they have all the tools in, in the kitchen that are going to make producing those fries and getting to you, getting them to you by the time <laughs> you reach the drive through window. Um, and that's kind of been a problem for anybody involved with these type of loans in the past. They haven't the systems haven't been in place um, or they haven't had confidence in the systems for every time that they're working with a new customer on a loan origination for them to say, hey, would you like to finance some energy efficiency or solar or resilience as part of your refinance? But it really has to become uh, that easy. And again, things, things are changing. You know, I just refinance. Uh, and part of the process when I was asked, actually, the loan officer um, from Rocket Mortgage asked me, do I have solar on my house? Um, they wanted to know because they wanted to know if I had a personal loan that they could have refinanced with one of these green mortgages. Um, but he told me they, their, their near term plan is to also ask if I, if I had said I didn't have solar, they would have asked, do I want solar? Um, and so it's really embedding these in these processes and knowing that the back end is, is, is available and easy to use so that that can be integrated for everybody. So that was an example of what uh, Rita was talking about with paying off a personal loan. And um, that's, one, that's one use case that's pretty straightforward, um, but we think there's ways to make the uh, paying off energy efficiency work uh, pretty straightforward too. Next slide, please, Craig. So, this is just retrospectively looking back over the last several decades, you know, <laughs> why didn't we get to somewhere first? And I think in, in one of my opinions about this is there've been a lot of round tables over, over decades where a lot of different folks from different industries were put together um, to talk about commonly, how would we get to solutions? Um, and, you know, although those resulted in a few aha moments, uh, over time, I think a lot of the times the typical realization of participants is, wow, the people in those other industries don't really know what my industry is like, um, rather than finding common ground. Um, but that's, you know, the way this has been discussed has been changing too. So next slide, Greg. And over the last 10 plus years, there actually have been um, individual industries actually taking this topic on as their industry groups do their own business on their own work. Um, and there's been a few, uh, you know, green leaning uh, generalists going around between all these tables, keeping common threads alive between them. But, you know, as an example, you know, the real estate industry did establish, uh, as they were establishing their own green definitions for all their fields, they established key ones just to describe energy and green performance. Uh, and then more recently, like the lending industry with their MISMO standards in the mortgage industry, um, they now have largely adopted the same fields that the real estate um, industry uh, developed many years prior. And then if you go around the, to the tables, you know, the appraisal foundation who sets the standards for appraising on single family homes, they actually set standards for how you take that information and, and incorporate it into an, your opinion of value as an appraiser which also is what now gets fed into automated valuation models. Um, and they, they did leading work on this more than a decade ago. And then folks like the Appraisal Institute and others have incorporated that into training for appraisers. And as I mentioned, um, folks with automated valuation models have incorporated it as well. And um, more recently in the last few years, the GSEs have combined to lead a universal appraisal data set uh, redesign initiative. That's a big mouthful, but what it means is the underpinning um, amount of uh, data that all appraisal and valuation is based off of is changing, modernizing, and moving into a deep, big data space that allows for automation to take place. Um, and then all the folks uh, like, you know, the hat that I typically wear in my day job around green building certification and ratings, uh, there's been a lot more coming together on that. They're making their data um, available to common um, places like the U.S. Green Building Registry. Um, 
And then finally, the national labs and DOE have stepped up where needs have been identified by the other groups. And one of these is the energy cost estimate for every home. And that's now uh, available. In the next slide, we'll actually dive into that a little bit more. And so the energy cost estimate is um, what it sounds like, but it's for every single home in the United States based off a few pieces of data. And it provides a baseline value that every home's energy performance can be compared one against the other based on the, the common metric that everybody understands, dollars, in this case, dollars per year to handle the energy bills of that home. And you know, the National Renewable Energy Lab specifically developed this as a resource for the real estate and finance industry because it had been identified as something that was missing. Um, the SAVE Act from 10 years ago identified the need for this, but it never existed. The Appraisal Institute's Green Addendum um, identified the need for this, but there was, there was no way to plug it into their addendum. Uh, for appraisers to calculate value. So it's very exciting. And you know, the energy cost estimate is just one example of using DOE's you know, data, their super cube, super computing capabilities um, at the national labs and you know, the expertise in the national lab staff to bring those resources in to help us get by this industry to get by barriers that are out there. And so additionally, DOE you know, could um, uh, be used as a future resource to come up with additional resources like prescriptive lists of you know, cost-effective measures uh, just, again, as another step to make things even easier for everybody involved uh, when thinking about making improvements and financing them. So next slide. And I'm going to hand it off to Greg, uh, because even though I just mentioned you, know, Department of Energy, I think, is ready to help the Biden administration's whole of government approach means that many other agencies you know, have a role, obviously, when it comes to housing. And uh, Greg's going to talk about the current political moment. Thanks, David. So to, to round us out here with this fourth category, um, we obviously are at a unique political moment. Right now, we know the Biden administration is pushing a whole of government approach to addressing the climate crisis. And at least in RMI's view, there's no reason why government sponsored enterprises and, and FHFA shouldn't be included in, in that approach. So um, another big reason is FHFA now has new leadership since June with acting director Sandra Thompson, uh, who has already taken meaningful actions to sort of redirect FHFA and support expanding access to fair and affordable lending. Our hope is that FHFA will start um, really recognizing the intersectionality between energy burdens, climate impacts, uh, affordability, racial equity, and, and other challenges of the current times. And meanwhile, we're seeing a lot of ambitious climate action coming from city and state leaders. And there may be opportunities to connect those dots and start leveraging green mortgages as a key tool to improve uh, local housing stocks. So in a sentence, RMI believes that, that federal policy, whether it's regulatory action from FHFA or otherwise, can start leveraging the power of financial markets to decarbonize and strengthen housing across the country. We mentioned this term climate alignment before. Uh, already large pr private financial institutions representing over $19 trillion have committed to align their lending and investment activities with global climate targets in the years ahead. Um, RMI believes that the GSEs and other federally supported housing finance entities can and must do the same. So this is different from other federal programs that use public funds for retrofits like the DOE's weatherization assistance program, which is super valuable and doing great things. But here we're talking about leveraging existing mechanisms and maybe a, a relatively small amount of public funds to stimulate what could become a significant um, private capital investment flow into improving a major swath of the housing market. So what could this look like? Um, thinking beyond just the GSEs to consider other federally supported housing finance players, the Biden administration, FHFA, HUD, and VA can all take action to build on existing products and mechanisms and support these goals. Um, these entities together back an estimated 70% of all single family mortgage originations and they set standards to which lenders and appraisers nationwide are conforming. So they each offer existing products. We've, we've covered Fannie's Homestyle Energy, Freddie's Green Choice, but also FHA and VA have their own energy efficient mortgage. 
um, all of these are, are really underutilized to date, but can be enhanced and streamlined and, and really scaled up through decisive policy interventions to finance home energy and resilience improvements at among the lowest cost of capital for millions of American homes. Um, but how do we do that? So just for example, the government could enable and support home energy labeling and disclosure policies nationwide, leveraging things like home energy score and HERS ratings to not only inform consumers about the energy performance of the homes they're buying or renting, um, which by the way is information they really should have a right to know from a, from a con consumer protection standpoint, but also to help lenders more effectively target green mortgage products and resources where they're most needed. Um, even without disclosure policies, the GSEs and these other entities should incorporate home energy data and home climate risk data into their underwriting and appraisal standards as David just touched on, to correct this major blind spot and support the development of the green mortgage market on the single family side. Um, as we heard, this data exists. There are tools that can readily auto-populate key fields to make this easy. Um, also, the GSEs, FHA, and VA should streamline and standardize their green mortgage products and processes to make all of this a lot easier for lenders to offer as part of all mortgage transactions versus treating these as like niche specialty products, um, really driving towards that, do you want fries with this kind of approach. Um, they can also tactically develop plans to expand access within lower income communities, communities of color, who we know disproportionately struggle with high energy burdens and adverse climate impacts. Uh, these kinds of green mortgage products can be combined uh, with down payment assistance and counseling services for first time home buyers to expand access to home ownership and to help sustain that home ownership in a more comfortable, safe, healthy environment for these families. Uh, in addition, a relatively small amount of public funds could be used to offset the upfront costs for more lenders to roll out single family green mortgage programs as well as to subsidize the cost of energy ratings, energy audits, and retrofits for LMI households. And lastly, just sort of zooming out, um, RMI would argue that these entities should, should all be required to start measuring, disclosing, and reducing their portfolio-wide carbon emissions estimates and climate risk exposure so that we're more prepared for increasing climate events in the future and the losses that come with them while also reducing our contributions to that in increasing climate risk. So in terms of opportunities and calls to action for, for NHC members to consider, um, we're here really to just raise awareness to get this on more radar screens. We'd really encourage you to, to talk about this, talk about the untapped market opportunity here with your networks and your contacts, incorporate this stuff into you know, policy recommendations you may be making to the administration, or the new FHFA director, um, support other related federal policies that advance these goals. So David mentioned the SAVE Act, I think that's a good example. Um, and if there's interest, there may be potential to, to sort of build a small coalition amongst us, further develop these kinds of recommendations with an NHC led uh, working group. Um, engage, so we, we all are, are pretty involved in the GSE's duty to serve uh, process. They recently developed plans for the next duty to serve window, which is 2022 to 24. Um, and we're, we, we are calling for more ambition on this front. There are plans related to green mortgages and, and addressing energy burdens in LMI households. We think there's a lot more that can be done and, and are really calling for more ambition. This is a process that anybody can get involved in. So we'd encourage you all to, to also, you know, be, become part of this public comment process. If you're not, help monitor, support implementation, respond to RFIs issued by the FHFA on this front. Um, because really the duty to serve offers a, a pretty important mechanism to first serve the underserved borrowers and market segments that could benefit the most from these sorts of solutions. And then in terms of pilots, lenders, borrower counselors, other market actors in the mix here can promote the use of green mortgages and and help testing solutions um, really to prove concept and, and try to validate. So for lenders in the room, if you're, if you're worried about first mover risk, it's worth noting that GoodLeap, which was formerly called LoanPal, uh, has, is one example of a, of a lender who's had a lot of success growing their business model around the use of these products. And now, as David mentioned, Rocket Mortgage is actually getting in the game, leveraging these products to finance solar improvements. 
Um, so now's really the time for market leading lenders to, to lean in and capture a share of this, of what we hope is a growing market. Uh, a lot more needs to happen on the energy improvement side of that equation, but we're, we're optimistic that, that it will. Um, and if you have other ideas, uh, feel free to, to chat them in. We can talk about them in the upcoming Q&A se segment. Here, uh, we just wanted to quickly highlight a report that we jointly put out back in March, and I'll chat this link out to the group so you have it. Um, <clears throat> this is, is sort of, it's the source of where a lot of the content that we've covered today is coming from. Uh, this report offers uh, recommendations really from a home performance perspective to reduce a lot of the friction from what we perceive in the green mortgage origination and securitization process. So we'd encourage you all to check that out for more detail. And with that, I think we can open it up to questions, comments, ideas. Uh, I think we're encouraging folks to use the Q&A tab versus the chat tab. We've got some questions already in. Um, so we'll go through those and then I will copy paste our contact information and please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, to pick up this conversation after today. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll ask the other panelists to just pop their videos back on and we can start uh, looking at some of the questions that have already come in. So here's a quick one for you, Maddie. Can you share more about the statistic you mentioned that most payday loans are sought by consumers who are behind on utility bills? Yeah, great question. And uh, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I can share a link to the um, report if that's helpful, but um, I think it was the report's branded with the Center for Financial Services Innovation. Um, and it is from 2012. So I think it's, you know, important to temper that, you know, it, of course, the, it's been almost a decade since then. I, I have not seen updated statistics on this front. I would eagerly take them uh, <laughs> if, if other folks are aware. But, um, you know, I think there's a few factors about paying uh, utility bills and in particular energy bills that can make it challenging for folks to adequately um, budget on a month to month basis, you know, just the fact that the energy bills can fluctuate so greatly um, between seasons of the year and, and other factors. Um, and it comes every month and it matters a lot to people to not have their utilities turned off. Um, we know that, um, you know, that's an area where people want to keep the lights on um, a lot of, you know, whether it's Food not going bad in the fridge or something else um, more more medically vital um, for folks. There's a lot of reasons people get a utility bill. They might not have prepped with their um, uh, on the month to month basis. Maybe it's surprisingly high, um, and and then they just need to pay. Um, I'll, I'll also just mention that even aside from just um, you know seeking various loan products that might exist for folks to pay energy bills. Uh, the government spends billions of dollars already on supporting low income housing energy affordability through the LIHEAP program. Um, and you know that I think speaks a little bit to the degree to which energy inaffordability has been kind of a hidden crisis for a long time now, where there's been some um, resources that have helped folks manage and you know maybe scrape by, but this is a larger issue that folks are, need to confront. Thanks, Maddie. Here's another one that may be for, for you, Rita. Do you find that with the $500 LLPA credit Fannie and Freddie offer for green mortgages makes it so that green mortgages have lower interest rates on average than conventional uh, or generally amount the same as a conventional, as in no reason not to choose it? Any thoughts on the, the use of that $500 credit? Sure, um, it would be, and it would be great to maybe also hear some in, in the chat or the Q&A from some, any lenders who are experienced with this, but um, the, I didn't even actually mention this in the Green Mortgage 101 slide, but Fannie and Freddie offer um, an incentive to lenders to offer this uh, product, so $500 credit. And there is no specification, uh, you know, how the lender is to use that. Sometimes lenders use that to offset um, say a home energy report or other costs, um, you know, either for the consumer or for them. Um, so it's really up to the lender how they want to um, offer that loan and if they want to make an adjustment in the rate. Um, so there is no specification on how that is used. 
Thanks, Rita. This one might be a good one for you, David. For green loans for energy retrofits, does the observed data ever include energy use after the retrofit? Do we ever observe how well the upgrades perform relative to their costs? Yeah, well, right now I would say that the, the mortgages that are currently being originated on the single family side aren't really, um, there's not a qualified, well, there's not a requirement for that to take place. On the multifamily side, they're actually, uh, is a requirement that ongoing reporting of um, utility bills comes in in order to maintain the status of their loan um, over time for that um, that multifamily project. Uh, at the moment, uh, the you know the best case recommendation or best practice recommendations that we've been making have not been to add that level of complexity to the single family um, projects, but rather to focus on making sure that things that get recommended are improvements that have shown a long track record of actually providing savings. I'll also Thanks, chime Dave. in there that, you yeah. know, the um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac products that do exist do require a home energy report as part of their um, process. And so I commonly use one of I manage the home energy score program. There's also the um, uh, HERS rating system that are, are commonly used. And I, th I think other ones also qualify as well in certain use cases, but those are meant to kind of be the basis of tools that recommend cost-effective improvements um, that then the lender and consumer can use to better understand what's going to be cost-effective and then incorporate that into their uh, product. Great, thank you both. I think Kevin Kane asked a question that really gets to the heart of the challenge here in my mind that we'll just you know, open it up for general thoughts. What are, what are your recommendations for approaching lenders to ask them to begin offering green mortgages? What do you recommend saying when they say that it's too complicated, not on their radars right now, or not of interest unless it can deliver a thousand homes next quarter? I've heard all of those. We've convinced a number of lenders to accept our clients with green mortgages, but none of them are themselves promoting to their clients. Any takers? I mean, I think this is why, you know, we, we have identified a lot of the challenges and we, we hear you, you know, um, we know there's some operational complexities and other barriers, um, which is why I think that like, there needs to be a lot of intervention um, and a lot of things happening quickly at once. Um, so, you know, David, you look like you're about ready to jump in here too. Um, but we don't disagree about the challenges um, and have, have experienced those firsthand. However, um, you know, whether it's a combination of incentives um, or specific pilots um, that showcase success, um, I think we're, we're really trying to put our heads together and work with uh, the lenders as well as the broader community who can help them to address those challenges. David, do you want to take something? Well, no, too? I was just going to say, as, yeah. Yeah. As the smaller nonprofit entity, yeah. uh, I could stick my neck out a little further, and <laughs> you know, say, yeah, you know, I really believe in mandatory education, uh, not if not, you know, not necessarily mandatory action, but mandatory education. And so, for instance, I think one way you would actually get loan officers to uh, talk about it is if in every loan origination there actually was a disclosure statement that had to be signed by the loan officer and the borrower that said, oh their uh, borrower was made aware of the fact that they could have borrowed money for energy related improvements. The same way that, you know, as you have to sign all the other disclosure statements while you're um, uh, signing off on your mortgage, whether it's purchase or refi, that level, that would be the number one thing in my mind, uh, again, speaking for this nonprofit earth event, that would um, cue up the conversation to actually take place and raise awareness is if it was just a mandatory part of um, the process so there at least had to be a piece of paper, virtual or real, put in front of somebody that they signed to say they were aware. I think we have time for one more. Um, and I think, so David Botany asked, or made a really good comment that we touched on, didn't really get into. One obstacle for the GSE products is it can be hard for the appraiser to increase the value of the property by the amount of the cost of the new energy efficient appliances. Most view solar panels as having little value for increased home price. An energy efficient refrigerator could save a borrower a lot of money, but would get zero lift from, a, from an appraiser. Um, 
David, maybe do you, I see you're starting to type an answer. Do you want to speak to uh, potential solutions to solve that appraisal challenge? All right. Uh, yeah, this is, I was just going to say. In a minute or less? <laughs> very quickly. This is an area where I think automated data flows, sort of the, the change that's happening right now with the initiative on changing the, the universal appraisal data set is going to provide the data combined with the data that already exists out there um, and this NREL tool you now have the, the, the data solutions to enable automated valuation models to handle this. And so removing the obstacle of an of a untrained individual person from the system and replacing it with a system that is informed uh, by all the available data and, you, and, and calculates it according to approved methods. So I, I, I think this is something within two years at the outside that we're gonna see um, this barrier really uh, be melting away. Thanks, David. I think that's all we have time for. We'll try to, in the next couple of minutes, answer some questions via chat and, and always willing to follow up with folks afterwards if there's interest. Um, but I think right now we'll, we'll turn it back over to NHC to close out. Thank you. Um, this was great. Um, it's a fascinating subject and, and we're thrilled to have, you know, this kind of expertise. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, also want to remind you that on Thursday, September 30th, we're going to be having a conference on Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the future of American home ownership. Um, it's going to be um, a great convening, uh, beginning with a conversation between myself and FHFA Acting Director Sandra Thompson who uh, I think is anybody who has been watching knows has been doing an amazing job um, over the last several months, um, really moving the enterprises uh, forward. And um, there's a lot of open questions out there on their uh, request for input and the duty to serve reg and on uh, a, a wide range of other issues. And we're gonna be talking about all of them. The uh, also um, we'll be joined by um, some really great panelists like uh, Christy Furco at Wells Fargo. Uh, Wells Fargo is, is also sponsoring um, the convening. And so we're uh, thrilled to have them involved as well as uh, people like Sarita Battles at JP Morgan Chase, Chrissy Johnson at Rocket Mortgage, Mike Lofton at HomeWise, Loretta Williamson at Truist, and um, some great presentations uh, with leading edge research uh, from the Mortgage Bankers Association um, the um, USMI uh, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So I hope you'll join us. And um, I also hope you will join us and uh, check out our website to join NHC. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank all. You. Thank you.